Section 16.9, the divergence theorem. Regions E that are simultaneously of types 1, 2, and 3 are called simple solid regions. The boundary of E is a closed surface, and we use the convention that the positive orientation is outward. That is, the unit normal vector N is directed outward from E. So we use this definition in order to come up with a uh, divergence theorem for simple solid regions, which is proved similarly to the way that you could prove the special case of Green's theorem. What you do is you take the simple solid region E, you project it into each of the uh, x, y, y, z, and x, z planes, and then you prove that the triple integral of the divergence will be equal to the surface integral f dot ds. What you do is you split up the triple integral of divergence into uh, integrals over each of the parts of the, kind of like the gradient, the way that you had each partial derivative separated. You separate the divergence into each of the partial derivatives. You make each of those its own triple integral, and then you prove that each of those is equal to the surface integral. So what we can do is just use this thing, assume that we're able to prove it, and we, now we have a much handier way of evaluating surface integrals, considering we can take them and make them a triple integral over the divergence. Of course, we have to assume that we have a surface with positive orientation, so that means that all of the normal vectors point out of the surface. Okay, let's do an example of this real quick. We can find the flux of the vector field zi plus yj plus xk over the unit sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. So using uh, the divergence theorem, we can say that the divergence of f is equal to the partial derivative with respect to x of z plus the partial derivative with respect to y of y plus the partial derivative with respect to z of x. And notice this guy's 0, this guy's 1, and this guy's 0. So we just get 0 plus 1 plus 0, which is 1. And the divergence theorem says that our surface integral will be the triple integral of this divergence. So that means the surface integral f dot ds will be equal to the triple integral over this unit sphere. How about we call that the, the unit ball b? And we'll throw in the divergence. So then this is pretty nice because we're just integrating 1. You, you see a triple integral and you start cringing a little bit, but very often we can just write it out as a volume because the triple integral of 1 is just the volume of our ball. And the volume of the unit sphere is just 4 thirds times its radius cubed, so it's just 4 thirds times pi times 1 cubed. So that's just 4 pi over 3. And that's the flux. But we do another example and try to evaluate this surface integral. Notice that the region that they gave us to integrate over has four different components. Uh, so it'd be kind of a mess if you wanted to do the surface integral. You'd have to do four different surface integrals. And even doing one surface integral takes kind of a long time. You often have to do a cross product, but in this case we can do our entire thing just using a triple integral using the divergence theorem. So we'll assume this thing is positive orientation. We'll calculate the divergence of f to be the partial with respect to x of xy plus the partial with respect to y of y squared plus e to the xz squared plus the partial with respect to z of sine of xy. And that ends up becoming y plus 2y, which is 3y. So now we have our region E. If we want to do a triple integral, we need to describe it. So we'll say it's all of the points x, y, z, such that how about we 
project into the uh, XZ plane. Looks like that will probably be the easiest way to do it. So we'll call this a type 3 solid region. So in that case, we'd have um, two functions, two y equals functions. We'd have one over here and one over here. So it looks like y should go between 0 and 2 minus z. And then in the xz plane, we would have this thing over here, where it looks like z goes from the bottom 0 to the parabola on top, 1 minus x squared, and then x would just go between constant values from um, minus 1 to 1. So let's write that out. We'll have x between minus 1 and 1. We'll have z between 0 and 1 minus x squared. We'll integrate from bottom to top in the plane. And then our projection as a type 3 solid region says that y will go between two functions of x and z, so that's between 0 and 2 minus z. And then our surface integral can be written as a triple integral using the divergence theorem. So it'll be the triple integral over e of the divergence of f dv, which is the triple integral over e of 3y dv, and that's going to be 3 times the integral from minus 1 to 1 for x, 0 to 1 minus x squared for z, and 0 to 2 minus z for y. And we're integrating y, because I pull out 3, dy dz dx. So that's going to be 3 times the integral from minus 1 to 1, integral from 0 to 1 minus x squared, 2 minus z squared over 2 dz dx. And that becomes 3 over 2 times the integral from minus 1 to 1 minus 2 minus z cubed over 3 from 0 to 1 minus x squared, which is minus 1 half the integral from minus 1 to 1 x squared plus 1 cubed minus 8 dx. And we can just wrap that up by simplifying a little bit. We get the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the 6 plus 3x to the 4th plus 3x squared minus 7, which is 184 over 35 when you take your antiderivatives, just polynomial, so it's not that much work. So notice that it was a little bit of work to do this, but integrating 3y as a triple integral is still way less work than doing three different surface integrals over this thing with this mess over here. So divergence theorem definitely comes in handy. Similar to the way that we extended Green's theorem to apply to regions that have holes in them, we can apply we can extend the divergence theorem beyond simple solid regions to apply to finite unions of simple solid regions. That is, that we can extend it to regions that have kind of holes in them, or like uh, little spaces in between, hollow spaces. So in this case, we're doing Green's theorem on this orange bit. This so is the orange solid. So you could think of it like if this was uh, an egg. We're doing it on the white part of the egg and not including the yolk. So what we do is we orient the uh, egg so that the normal is pointing outward. And on the inner surface, the normal is pointing outward over there. However, when we try to do um, the divergence theorem, then what we'll end up doing is we want to do it for this orange bit. So that means that 
we need the normal on the orange bit to always point outward. So it always points outward on the top already, but if I look at the inside, it should be pointing outward over here like this in order for us to apply the divergence theorem. But the normal on S1 points up by default. So what we have to do is we have to use the divergence theorem, set it equal to a surface integral. Remember by definition, the surface integral is f dot n ds, which we then split into a surface integral f dot minus n1 for the normal that points inward on S1 so that we can use divergence theorem and outward on S2. So that means that this thing is the same as the surface integral of minus the surface integral of S1 in the positive orientation plus the surface integral on S2. So very similar to the way that we had to do uh, minus orientation when we did Green's theorem for some inner uh, curve so that we could end up canceling out when we uh, stitch them together. So we want to kind of, not exactly the same, but it is a similar proof idea. So as an example, how about we take another look at the electric fields that we saw in example 16.1.5. So in this case, the electric charge Q is located at the origin, and the vector x equals x, y, z is a position vector. We'll use the divergence theorem to show that the electric flux of E through any closed surface S2 that encloses the origin is uh, E dot ds, which is 4 pi epsilon Q. So how about we come up with a surface S1? Because trying to do the surface integral over, a sur over any surface, any closed surface S2 that encloses the origin would be super hard. But if we come up with a surface S1 that's just a circle, and then we say that that one's equal to any arbitrary one when we take the surface integral, then it would be a lot easier. Because if this is supposed to work for any closed surface S2, then it should work for a circle also. So how about we say that the circle S1 is given by the equation uh, magnitude of x equals a which should make sense. That means we're taking the square root of x squared plus y squared plus c squared equal to a, or x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals a squared. So that's a uh, sphere of radius a. If we were to calculate the divergence of e, so that we can use the divergence theorem, we would get that the divergence is zero. The reason we're not doing the calculation is because it is actually a little bit of work. It's not really so much as it's hard, but it's a little bit messy. So you could do that yourself, convince yourself the divergence is zero. Now, what we want to do is take the surface integral over S2 of E dot ds. We will try to show that it's equal to the surface integral over S1 and then compute that. So the surface integral over S2, well, taking a look at this, we see that we have divergence equal to minus the surface integral over S1 plus the surface integral over S2 because we're taking this S1 guy and we're going to stick it inside of the surface S2 so it's kind of like this. So it's going to be a small little ball. So what we'll do is we'll solve for uh, S2. We'll take this and add it to the other side. So then we'll have S2 equal to divergence plus the integral over S1, surface integral over S1. So surface integral over S1 of E dot ds be equal to the triple integral over E of the divergence of E dv, which is great because we magically said the divergence of E is zero. So that means that this guy is zero. And this was supposed to be a plus sign. Okay, so now we have the surface integral over S1 of E dot ds. Because we're just adding zero to it. So by definition, this is the surface integral over S1 of E dot and ds. So how about we compute that? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll say that 
e dot n is equal to, let's see, we said e is this thing. So that's epsilon q over length of x cubed times x. And we're going to dot that with our normal. But notice that the normal that points out of the circle is just the position vector, x, y, z. And then we take the unit normal by dividing by its length. And the uh, length of that vector is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. We said that that's equal to a. We we're setting a to be the radius of our little sphere. So we're dotting this with the normal x over length of x. And that's going to be epsilon q over length of x to the fourth x dotted with x. Just end up moving this thing over a little bit. And we get epsilon q over the length of x squared because x dotted with x is just length of x squared, and then we can cancel out 2 in the top and bottom. So we have length of x equal to a, so length of x squared is equal to a squared. So we end up with x epsilon q over a squared. OK, so now we can say that the surface integral over s2, e dot ds, is equal to the surface integral over s1 of e dot and ds, as we just said up over here. So this means that it's, let's see, we have epsilon q over a squared as a constant, so we can just pull that out, because that's what e dot n is. And then we just have the surface integral over s1 ds. But when we integrate 1 as a surface integral, it's just a surface area. So this is epsilon q over a squared times the area of s1, which is very easy to compute. The area of a sphere, the surface area of a sphere, is just 4 times pi times the radius squared, so that's 4 pi a squared. So our a's cancel. And we just have 4 pi epsilon q, which is what we wanted. Notice that in section 16.7, we discussed Gauss's law, which said that our net charge q was equal to epsilon 0 times the surface integral of e dot ds. So Epsilon zero was the permittivity of free space. Q is our net charge. In this case, we have an electric charge located at the origin. So this is a special case of Gauss's law, where if you were to replace epsilon with one over four pi times epsilon zero, then notice you would get from uh, over here you would replace uh, epsilon 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, then move epsilon 0 to the other side, and you would get exactly this.